The renal role in acid-base balance is to excrete the daily acid load. Ammonia is produced from glutathione in the proximal cells. There is a daily excretion of 1 milliequivalent per kilogram of acid into the tubules. This combines with ammonia to form ammonium. The ammonia cycle increases the concentration of ammonia across the medulla. And the acid load, the daily acid load, is excreted and buffered by ammonia and appears in the urine as ammonium. Another important renal role in acid-base balance is the reabsorption of filtered bicarbonate. 85 to 90% of filtered bicarbonate is reabsorbed in the proximal tubules. First, the hydrogen ion is excreted via the sodium hydrogen exchanger. This pairs with bicarbonate in the urine and the carbonic acid that is formed undergo reactions that are mediated by the carbonic anhydrase enzyme. This leads to the return of CO2 into the proximal tubules, generation of bicarbonate again, and eventually this bicarbonate is returned to the bloodstream. There is normally no bicarbonate in the urine, and this is an important point to note. We go on next to the initial evaluation of acid-base disorders. These are very familiar basic rules in acid-base chemistry, the bronsted lowry theory, the Henderson equation, and eventually we have the henderson hesebach equation. The most important thing to note in the henderson hesebach equation is that pH, bicarbonate, and PCO2 are all bound in a very strict mathematical relationship, and they cannot deviate from this henderson hesebach equation. In the very initial approach to any acid-base disorders, there are three important questions that we have to ask. First, is there acidemia or alkalemia? Second, is it a metabolic or a respiratory disorder? Third, is it mixed or is it a pure disorder? Step one, is there an acidemia or alkalemia? If the pH is available, we definitely should take a look at that. Normal pH is between 7.35 to 7.45. If pH is high, that suggests an alkalemia. If it is low, it is an acidemia. And if the pH is normal, there may be a compensated acid-base disorder. We have to look at the PCO2 and the bicarbonate for compensation. Step two, is it respiratory or metabolic? Understanding the primary acid-base disorder is very important. First, if you look at the bicarbonate, if the bicarbonate is low, a more common interpretation of that would be that there is a primary metabolic acidosis. It is less common to have a respiratory alkalosis with a concomitant metabolic compensation. Next, you look at the PCO2 in the arterial blood gas. And if the PCO2 is high, the more common interpretation is that of a respiratory acidosis. While a metabolic alkalosis is much less common, the most important thing is to look at a patient and we will know if there is an underlying respiratory disorder or a metabolic disorder. These are the common causes of respiratory disorders. In respiratory acidosis, it is quite often due to inadequate alveolar ventilation. In other words, any process that suppresses respiration. This can be due to central nervous system depression, due to drugs, due to trauma or due to stroke, any nerve or muscular disorder that suppresses the respiratory system, airway disorders such as due to obstruction, 
lung diseases from pneumonia or pulmonary edema, chest wall or diaphragmatic defects. Sometimes it could be due to excessive CO2 production. For example, in hypercatabolic states, malignant hypothermia or some forms of poisoning. Respiratory alkalosis, on the other hand, is due to excessive alveolar ventilation or hyperventilation. This can be due to central nervous system issues such as in head injury, stroke drugs, psychogenic drugs and pregnancy. Hypoxemia can cause a patient to hyperventilate. Other pulmonary causes such as asthma, pulmonary embolism and edema can also increase ventilation. Finally, it could be iatrogenic, for example, due to ventilator settings. In step three, we have to decide if it is a mixed or pure disorder. And I bring us back to the henderson hesselbach equation in which there is a fixed mathematical relationship between pH, bicarbonate and pCO2. In order to determine if there is a complex or mixed respiratory metabolic disorder, we need to check for expected compensation. If the primary condition is a respiratory acidosis, the initial pCO2 will be elevated, and for every 10 mmHg increase in pCO2, there's a compensation by the kidneys to increase the bicarbonate. In an acute respiratory acidosis, the bicarbonates will increase by 1 millimole per liter, while in chronic respiratory acidosis, it will increase by 4 millimoles per liter. If it is due to a primary respiratory alkalosis, PCO2 would fall, and for every 10 mmHg fall in PCO2, bicarbonate will fall. It goes in the same direction. And in acute respiratory alkalosis, it will fall by 2 millimoles per liter, while in chronic respiratory acidosis, it's 5 millimoles per liter. If you look at metabolic disorders in metabolic acidosis, bicarbonate falls, and for every one drop in bicarbonate, you will have a corresponding drop in PCO2 by 1.2. There's no difference between uh, acute or chronic metabolic disorder. In metabolic alkalosis, with every one millimole per liter increase in bicarbonate, there's a corresponding increase in PCO2 by 0.6 mmHg. It's difficult to try to remember the compensation. That's why I've developed this compensation memory aid. For respiratory conditions, I would say 1 to 4 for 10 carbon more, 2 to 5 for 10 carbon less. This reflects the changes in bicarbonate in acute or chronic respiratory conditions. In metabolic disorders, I would say 1.2 for 1 bicarb lost. 0.6 more for a bicarb more. And this reflects the changes in PCO2 for each change in bicarbonate.